Yo, Katie, tell them what they're about to listen to. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the O. This, guys, is another exciting episode. Now, guys, believe me when I say it's another exciting episode. I really mean it. And I'll tell you why. This is our first female guest on the O podcast. Official female guest. And, um... I'm just intrigued, man. Like, I think we got, I think we locked out. I think we got the, a very good person to pioneer our female roster of guests. And um, I'm quite pleased with, with the conversation we had. It's a two-part conversation. Um, we, we spoke about so many things. We spoke like her personal life. We talked about um, uh, the, the work aspect. We talked about her projects. And it's just very intriguing to hear how she's been able to manage all these things at a young age. Um, who am I talking about? Well, I am talking about none other than Dr. Claire Anyamosigwe. So, who is she? Simple, I'll tell you. Dr. Claire Anyamosigwe is an award-winning dermatologist, PR consultant, keynote speaker, and filmmaker. At a tender age of 26, she became the founder of the world's first allergen-friendly vegan beauty company, Prima Skincare, to which she received awards including a medal from the Queen of England. All right? Now, her brand has also attracted a host of celebrity fans and global customers. Here's some name drops. Included Dame Judi Dench, Stevie Wonder, yeah, that's right, and the late artist formerly known as Prince, and so on. Whilst the brand became multi-awarded for helping women with skin allergies including eczema and psoriasis. After five successful years running the business alongside her family-run PR consultancy firm, she temporarily shut down her business to follow her first passion, filmmaking, by launching a film production company in 2017. And in that year, her company made their theatrical debut with the film No Shade making Dr. Claire the sixth black British female director to secure a theatrical release in the 123 years of cinema. Guys, there's so much I could read about her bio. Like, there's a lot of stuff she's done. So if you Google her, Dr. Claire Anyamo Sigwe, you're gonna see a long ass profile, right? This woman has been busy and I'm so happy to have her on the O podcast. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Claire Anyamo Sigwe. Dermatologist, keynote speaker, writer, filmmaker, PR consultant, soon to be author. Claire, can I go on? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you couldn't have pushed it, but I mean, yeah, it's like, ah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> being. <laughs> you're, 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 you're a consummate Renaissance woman. It's like, honestly, it's. Um, it's yeah, it's unbelievable. So anyway, thanks for joining me. Should I say Doctor Claire or Claire? Which do you prefer? Just call me Claire. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right, Claire. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, no, it's fine. Oh uh, yeah. Thanks for thanks for joining us today. And um, thanks. I know definitely. I'm I'm looking forward to learning a lot from about you. Um, and also, hopefully, the listeners would also be as excited and intrigued about you as I am by the end of this uh, conversation. Obviously, a very busy woman. How do you how do you do it all with your little daughter? I got wind of her name from one of the podcast episodes you did on a, a podcast called The Maker Podcast. Uh, Lavender, that's her name, right? Yeah, that's a lovely name. <laughs> that's a lovely Thank name. You. So, uh, yeah, how do you do it? Honestly, how do you do it? How do you still doing it with got a little little girl in your life? How? Well, um, yeah, it's an interesting question because I think. My daughter's now just turned 16 months, so mm. she's very, very tiny, um, mm. but she's growing up very quickly. Um, I really, you know, the last two years of my life have been a bit of a whirlwind because I've changed career. Um, I graduated in film, I took a 12 year hiatus, came back mm. and wrote my feature film and didn't do a short film or any proof of concept, just went straight into production. Yeah. And then four months, after we shot the film, but six weeks before the world premiere at our own festival, the yeah. British Urban Film Festival, I found out that I was pregnant. So, wow. it's, oh my God, like, we're just <laughs> about to start the festival circuit of the film. <laughs> we're like hustling and pounding the the, e, the email roads of um, distribution. Yeah. 
and you know it's like oh my god and now I've got morning sickness every day and um, wow. that was really tough it was a tough summer I was turning 33 and I was weak and frail and going through this process of being a new filmmaker and the press coverage, going to the radio stations and no one knew I was pregnant and it was a hot summer. And and now, you know, a year on, like the first year of being, like being pregnant is crazy because mm-hmm. you're just constantly tired, constantly like unwell. And then the thing called baby brain is very, very real. Like baby you're halfway brain. through a conversation. What oh yeah, yeah. When your, your, yeah, yeah. When your brain go, goes mush, I've never heard the term as baby brain. I mean, my wife's got two. We've well, got two kids. Yeah. Right. Okay. So your your husband and your your a father as well. So your wife may say to you, "Sorry, hon, I, I I can't." What, what was I saying? Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> midway through yeah, yeah. changes the subject because you're like, "Oh my god, I I can't actually remember what the point <laughs> of what I'm saying is," or totally forgetting basic stuff. So that yeah. started to happen as well because I run a few companies. So. You know, like I need to be on my game, but I had to be kind of kind to myself. So after the Buff Festival screening in June 2018, yeah. we, uh, me and Emmanuel, sort of vanished for a little while until August. So we had two months off. Yeah. And then I had a, 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 a an American screening in Washington. Yeah. That was the first time I've been on a flight, and I, I thankfully I was fine on the flight. But then when I touched down, I was very sick. But then during the Q and A, it was a two hour Q and A. Was okay. Like mm-hmm. you know, I felt like having the really new. Like when I'm busy, she was very very well behaved in my belly. Yeah. And then when I get <laughs> home or to the hotel, it's like vomiting and just oh really, my I'm, god. Yeah, it was insane. It's like she knew. Like m- mommy's working now, so it got to be quiet. And then when I was back at home, it was like pandemonium. Um, and then having the baby, obviously the 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 most miraculous and traumatic thing a woman can ever go through mm. 24 hours of labor delivering her mm. and then you know the film was up for a, a PAF award mm-hmm. PAF is the PAF American Film Festival which is founded by Danny Glover yeah um, it's an Oscar Academy Award awarded festival okay. so I was like oh, I really want to go but I've just given birth like can I do this don't be silly of course you can't so so you couldn't go for it we didn't go to that, and that oh, was okay. Uh, we didn't okay. win, and that's fine. Um, and then there was a couple of other awards, and then we got we got our distributor, um, our American distributor, got our film onto Amazon Prime. Yeah, and that was June 2019. So it's been on there for a whole year now. Yeah, and in that time, I really just had to be kind to myself because. Um, I was on the verge of burning. Well, not on the verge. I, I burnt out. You know, uh, we we went to. Um, I went to California in mm-hmm. 2019. I didn't bring the baby with me, so Manuel stayed behind with uh, Lavender. Oh, and wow. then we went to, yeah, so that's the first time being away from family. And that was quite uh, confronting the first time leaving my baby as well. So it's like, ah. Uh, Wait, how, uh, how old was Lavender at that time? She was eight months. Wow. So yeah, that was that oh, was man. quite, mm, it, was, it was only four days, but it felt like forever. I can imagine. Yeah, um, they came and got me at the airport. I've never been happy to see them. <laughs> After four days, <laughs> wow. Yeah, and then I just really said to myself, do you know what, like, I need a chef. Mm-hmm. Um, I need a nanny, so I had to mm-hmm. hire staff for the house, like, because mm-hmm. you, I can't do it. I can't do it all. You yeah. know, like, I can't do all the things that I do and be, like, super mum as well. It's physically draining. Yeah. But impossible mm. and because I've been doing it all and trying to like you know keep myself together as if I just hadn't had a baby like look snatched and all this crap mm. that women so I was under pressure to do because you're yeah. in the public eye and constantly being photographed um by December 2019 when we got back from Brazil because we went to Sao Paulo to do a South American premiere yeah I was very unwell so um, and I'd, I guess now they would call that COVID-19 what I had. It was a terrible flu. Okay. It was weak. I finished for like two weeks, all of like January, first yeah. half of January. Then I had some other health complications that I'll speak about later on in the year. Um, okay. And then Emmanuel got his MBE in March and yeah. I needed to do well for that. So a lot of meditation, a lot of prayer, a lot of holistic treatments, Mm. So your initial question, question I guess, was how how do I how do I be mummy and wife and myself because I'm still yeah. an individual 
people and a human being. Yeah. Whilst being the founder of Prime, co-founder of Buff Originals, mm-hmm. um, co-founder of Joe Claire PR or On Point Communications, which is a PR company, marketing officer at the British Urban Film Festival and Awards. Like I do a lot of things. So yeah. I guess really what I've come to realise is that I have to have balance in four areas of my life. And those four areas are my mental and emotional um, health. Yeah. Um, and I include spirituality in that if you're religious mm-hmm. or spiritual, uh, your your physical health. So because mm-hmm. they're separate, emotional, mental is not the same as physical. So physical health, uh, exercising, the things that I put into my body, and the things that I do. Yeah. And then my environment. So that's who I spend my time with and where I live or where I'm staying. Because mm. we travel five, six times a year. Like this is the first time in ten years that I've not been on a plane. Okay. I usually come to like play different countries like five, six times a year with business. And yeah. then the so environment. And then the fourth one is like career. So financial and and, and non financial because I volunteer and do different things mm. different charities as well. So if those four areas of your my life, I say your life, my life are yeah. are, are balanced, then I'm gonna be at my best. If any one of those areas are suffering so for me, it was my physical health was suffering mm. um, at the top of the year. Then it just destroys everything else because it's like a four-legged stool. So if you have a chair and you have four legs and one of the legs are broken, yeah. you can't sit on that chair. Do you get what mm. I'm saying? You have to you. repair that, that leg. So that's how I sort of see life. Um, and I call it a quadrant because there's four different boxes. Yeah. And so I have to take time because what I really realise is that I was focusing so much on my career, like my career was almost like it's only 25% of the four boxes, right? Because each box is 25%, but I was treating it like it was 75% of my life. Yeah. So, you know, I was chasing the money, chasing the, you know, the success. Yeah. But then my physical health and my environment was breaking down, you know, Um, and and that's not cool. So how did you realize, because you, obviously it's, it's, it's well thought out. You've got four quadrants and you know uh-huh. you need to give each, each of them equal measure of attention and, and love. At what point in, the, in your life did you realize? Because obviously you, you've kind of like encapsulated this thought and now you brought it into motherhood. So it's helped yeah. you. How, how were you able to get a clear formula? Is it like a blueprint that anyone can apply in their life? or? Yeah, it's, it is a blueprint that anyone could apply in their life. I guess it kind of culminated and came to me during COVID, if I'm totally honest. Okay, wow. Like, what mm. happens when you run on adrenaline, you don't get time to reflect whilst you're in the success and you're in, you know, the glory of sure. the enjoyment of the travelling and the, the screenings and the meeting new people and all, the, all of that. When you're mm. working it, you're working it, and then you rest... And then for a lot of entrepreneurs, you, you know, you burn out or you get ill or, you know, some adversity happens. I know Elon Musk, he suffered from depression and he, mm. he got he went through divorce. Yeah. Um, um, Ariana Huff, um, Huffington, Huffington. Yeah. she collapsed outside her New York apartment, you know, because she hadn't had enough sleep. Mm. So it it happens to the best of us and um i think there's not enough there's a, there's kind of like a really disturbing rhetoric that you need to always be working and hustling and grinding it's actually mm. very unhealthy um it's a lot better and smarter to work smart as opposed yeah. to working hard for a length of time like I- 10 years now I've been working extremely hard because mm. i've got crazy energy and a really a uh, strategic mind mm. but what that can do like I said if you don't look after the four boxes within your quadrant is that some part of your life will suffer greatly mm. and then it just throws everything else off mm. because what happens I said, if I give you the analogy of a chair yeah. if you sit on a chair with three legs now where there's meant to be four the others are going to become very weak quickly mm. Mm. Soon that chair is going to brought down and you're going to have to dash that chair away. And that was me. I had to dash myself away <laughs> from December until March. Yeah. Which is that three or four. Thankfully, there wasn't nothing in my calendar and I was yeah. able to do that. But, you know, I wasn't able to play with my daughter. I was very exhausted. Wow. Um, I- 
increased childcare, like when I'm supposed to be just relaxing in my yard. And then that makes you think, what's all the success if now I can't even enjoy it with my loved ones? Yeah. You know, I haven't paid my home en- enough attention. Certain areas need decorate, redecorating or, you know, you just sort of look at yourself and you say, okay, I'm doing, I'm working in it. But, yeah. and I'm be in that position. But what is, what does it mean if, like I said, some other important areas of your life are suffering, Yeah, you know, so me and Emmanuel, we had to go back to the drawing board in our marriage. Like what, mm. what gives us pleasure? How do we become, make sure that we take care of each other's needs as human beings and people who, have you know, made this lifelong commitment to, as opposed to your babe, send that email because do you know what I mean? Cause we work oh, yeah. together as a project. Yeah. So it, it becomes like, are we flatmates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are we yeah. <laughs> or yeah. have I your lover, your partner, your best mate? So we had to start factoring in date night. You know, like we have to go on a date every week. Um, we we now have like a nanny for, for lab. So she goes to her um, pretty much most weekends. Mm-hmm. Um, that stopped during covid but now that things are going to get more relaxed that will we'll reintroduce that but that is extremely important you know because yeah. we have to replenish and to just be ourselves and um to just enjoy our own company you know yeah. as well as being fantastic parents so i yeah. had to learn a lot I had to learn quickly and um, because i grew up in the care system i don't have a blueprint for what great parenting looks like imagine yeah. does yeah, my mum did this and my dad did that. And I'm yeah. like, oh, that's so dope. I, my mum, you know, uh, my dad passed away when I was nine years old. And then two years later, I went into the care system, uh, which is like a, a foster home, children's home, where loads of children yeah. live and so workers work there until I was 18. So mm. I, I don't know what, before that, we you know there was dysfunction in their marriage, my mum and dad. So, for me, I don't, I don't really know what great parenting looks like, so I'm having to create my own blueprint for what that looks like for Lavender. And I just know, for me, that's just like showering her with affection. Yeah. It's not, yes, yeah, so she gets loads of toys, and she's, you know, she's the first grandchild in the family on both sides, so she's okay, that's, like that's good. The, the golden child. But it's like <laughs> the queen of the is, dynasty. <laughs> in there every single day, and she's yeah. learning very. quickly. Yeah, she has to contribute contribute positively to the family environment, and you know she can't have things her own way all the time. Of course, and, yeah. You know, so yeah, yeah. What's What's interesting about what you've said is because obviously I've got questions lined up, and you just you just going from one to the other and answering these questions, yeah. and it's so seamless. Which is which is which it brings me to one thing is you're very uh, you're very driven and your purpose driven individual. Um, there are things you've said which, to a normal person, they would probably, they'll probably fall apart and break into pieces, and they would need extra support to pull them back together, right? Mm. I sense you're quite. I mean, you're married to Manuel, who's the founder of Buff, and um, mm-hmm. you know you. But I, I sense you're very self-sufficient as an individual. Now, yeah. what were your early years like? And because obviously, you know, our early years environment define us to a degree. So what were your yeah. early years like? And would you say that uh, this the upbringing you had is responsible for your drive, your makeup as a person? Let's just start from your early years and you can dive into that other question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, great, great question. Um, absolutely, you know, um, and it, and it's something that me and Emmanuel laugh about on a daily basis because we're both Igbo Nigerian, both born in Islington, but had completely different upbringings. Mm. And focusing on mine specifically, I grew up in a council estate, and he did too for a certain section of his early life. Mm. Um, but where we were it was, you know, a very hostile environment um, mm. in terms of mental, psychologically, like. Okay. It's not a place where there was like ga- gang culture. Mm. What there was is like, you know, older white people were very, very hostile and racist. Okay. And then because we were the only Nigerian family on a whole estate of like 200 families and we're the only Nigerians and Nigerian Igbo. Mm. So this was you and your, your mum? 
Me, my mom, my two older brothers and two younger sisters. So we're five children. Mm. My mom and my dad. My dad left the family home when I was five. Okay. Uh, to me, Hackney, so a, a localish borough. Uh-huh. Um, and then my mum carried on with us until my dad obviously passed, and then her health started to deteriorate. Uh-huh. But I learned at a very young age, like I would be the child that would make my own Barbie house out of toilet roll and, mm. you know, like the old rolls. I'd be like, yeah, no, don't yeah. throw them in because I want to make my own Barbie house because I know you can't afford wow. it. And all my oh, man, that's sweet. Do you know what I mean? And I would oh, get like, I would save like Kellogg's Frosty boxes <laughs> and oh toilet my rolls God, that's so... and like make Barbie houses. I would dye my Barbies like their hair brown uh. with like felt tip pen that I would probably like take from our local community centre, which was actually called Martin Luther King. The Martin Luther King uh center in a park called paradise park can you imagine right does it still exist the martin luther king it center? doesn't they knocked it down two years ago because i i oh, my gentrification, mom still right? there. yeah i went there to see if any of the old staff are still working there but paradise park is obviously still there mm-hmm. um, i was taking lavender there to go to a little mum and stay play yeah. thing um but uh, the MLK is not there. We used to call it the MLK for short. Yeah. Um, but that was the place where I learned how to make jewellery, okay. where I learned how to paint, where I learned how mm. to play like, cards, like blackjack and stuff, and win mm. little like, 10p, 20p bet. <laughs> the hustling <laughs> started. Hustling was starting from a young age. And I told this story quite frequently a couple of years ago when I started off in business. Yeah. Um, was that me and my friends, we started off selling ice cream when we were nine mm. Mm. because I couldn't afford to get the ice cream because it's 50p per ice cream. My mum had five kids. So yeah. we thought, well, let's buy the tub of ice cream for okay. 50 Let's buy the cones, a pack of 20 for 50p. Yeah. That's one pound, yeah? Yeah. And we can actually get... You know, we've got six to share because that's me, my brothers and sisters, and you, Kerry. And mm. then we've got 14 to sell at 15 p- 50p. Yeah. We can make five pounds. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, nice. we can make money, right? Well, that's so, a good business already, man. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I was like, <laughs> we need to compete with the ice cream man. So, yeah. what we started doing is that we started offering it 10p cheaper. Hmm. You can have two scoops as well. So now you're getting double scoops yeah. for 10p cheaper. Analyze the competition and, and, and annihilate them. Yeah. So I really started to think like, if I can't, because when my dad died, so did all the benefits of my dad in the sense of financial assistance. Mm. I wasn't getting pocket pocket money anymore. Yeah. Um, I couldn't afford for me to keep going to like little, you know, uh, I used to play, I can play wind instruments so I can read music. Okay. So my couldn't afford for me to go to my clarinet class anymore and my flute class and things like that. So a lot of things stopped. My brothers stopped playing football. They were mm. destined to go into the Arsenal squad. You know, things like oh, that. Wow. That that just devastated our family when my dad died and then my mum's health deteriorated and yeah. then were taken away by the state. So when I went mm. into care, I had oh, to... Oh, really- what age was this now when you entered the care? into care i went into care when i was nine nine okay um, yeah to an indian foster family and then again at 11 until 18 into mm. a proper children's home and so wow at that time i think that it was just i was just living in survival mode and education was my escapism like my home life is crap but mm. i'm excelling in education so i used to stay at the library extra late i would mm you know, really concentrate in class. But I get frustrated because I've got a hot temper. I had a mm. hot temper as a child. Mm. I'm extremely emotional. I'm born in July. I'm a Cancerian. So all of these different little things that I'd acknowledge about my personality, I was like, okay, well, I need to, you know, get that under wraps. And I think because I grew up in care, I was black, I was Nigerian, I was told by teachers and by mm. social workers, you're not, you're not really going to amount to much, you know. Really? Like, they told you that yeah. directly, like... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they'll tell you that, you know, the future's mm. not looking good for you lot, as in me and my two best friends, Jazz and Grace, you know, like, you'll be, so, we'll, we'll be shocked if you lot do something, you know, you, you, you've got the potential, Ooh. but life's going to be harsh for you, because... Why, why do they say that? Do, 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 do you, looking back now, do you think you're doing anything specific that would make them say such things, or... I think we were just very, like, I 
African, you know, like very mm. loud, very uh, like what they would describe as aggressive, but I would say creative. You know, mm. like I can see it in my daughter now. She's very, mm. hmm, she walks with <laughs> her chest high and she's 16 <laughs> months old. Do you know what I mean? She's not shy and meek. Got you, yeah. She knows that she's uh, a royal, like she's like a queen already. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I hear you, I hear you. That sort of, that sort of um, cipher, that energy, that aura. Yeah, that can so be very, very confident, very confident, self-assured. Yeah, yeah. self-assured. And then mm. I would read, you know. So I started in my teen years, like late teen years, reading things about mm. um, African culture or you know wise men from mm. history. You know, so I was really into Nietzsche, um, Nietzsche, and um, mm. the book Self Reliance, and just really mm. trying to understand like. What makes great people great? Because I think I realised at the age of about four when I used to graffiti on my mum's walls, I used to use her lipstick, a pink magenta lipstick, and I used to do my own signature. And I've still got that signature today. At even four though years I'm, old? Wow. Yeah, I knew I was going to be someone. Hmm. I knew from a very young age that I was here to do something specific. Hmm. You know what? My dad, before he passed, wanted me to be a nurse. And I'm okay. like, Dad... No, I don't know. I don't know. I knew I could take care of people. I enjoy taking care of people. Yeah. So I did Prima as a brand because that was all about taking care of people with allergies, yeah. skin and food. Um, so that, 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 that taking care of people is always at the heart of anything I do. Mm. Um, but I just thought, nah, that's dead. That, like, I'm too, I'm too much of an outlaw. I have to be my own boss. Mm. So make your own work- rules. Yeah, I'd work under people and I'd find myself being more inter- intelligent than them. And then there'd be that power struggle. No, I'm just being honest. There'd yeah. be that power struggle of like, you think you're, and it's like, it's not even that I think that I'm, I am. It's not even mm. that I'm thinking it. It's, it's true, isn't it? I'm actually cleverer than you. Uh, my mind is more advanced than you. I'm taking on mm. managerial roles. I'm expanding mm. the team or um, I, people come to me for leadership. So. Yeah. By the time I'm ready to leave a job, area managers are begging me to stay, trying to double my wage. I'm like, do you know what? It's not when I'm ready to leave. I'm ready to leave. Yeah, you know, when yeah. the time is right for me, I listen to myself. Mm. So I know myself quite well, and at the same time, I still understand that I don't know myself at all sometimes, and I need to shed that skin and become new. So. Yeah. That metamorphosis of being a child and then being an adolescent and then being a young woman and then now being like more of like a middle-aged woman now, mm. going into 35, it's like you change every couple of years. You change yeah. every day. I yeah. had this conversation with you earlier, but it's like mm. you change You change on a moment-to-moment basis and you should allow yourself to change. And I think sometimes we get so rigid as people. We're not very fluid. I'm yeah. very fluid. Like mm. today like this but tomorrow I might feel like that it's not that I'm flaky because mm. my people might be like you need to be more like fixed and uh, and this is but I'm like no because you need to be adaptable life is about adaptation mm. 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 I, adapt, I wouldn't have been able to survive living in care I might have had a nervous breakdown as a child I might have dropped out of school mm. I had to continue to adapt do you know what I mean when I moved into my own accommodation at 18 now I got you know I didn't become one of those girls like inviting all the mandem over every day and doing all mm. that I was as though I, I was very disciplined I was acting like I had strict parents so mm. you know that I lived in care and I was going through all of that because they were like but Claire you were so you were acting like your mum was gonna like kick your ass if you didn't get home at a certain time and you know, you lost your virginity late, and did it. I was like, yeah, but that's that's because I've got personal standards for my life. What? I know hmm. in the age of four that I'm here to do something specific, so I'm not going to treat myself any old yaga yaga way. Yeah, yeah you know yeah. what? You have to put yourself in a position of greatness, even if your dad dies, you go to care, hmm. the world tells you you're going to be nothing. You can still have high self esteem, and I do attribute high self-esteem to my two big brothers because they yeah. I was about to me. ask that yeah yeah they, if my two big brothers they didn't get to have the careers that they wanted to, to they wanted to be a defense for football and a goalie mm. uh, one of my brothers you know became unwell when my dad let, uh, died he he couldn't cope very well 
and, and then my other brother the same you know got into a bit of alcoholism oh, and man. you know they changed dramatically and i think that's mm. because men don't talk about their emotions um so yeah sorry feel free to interject Go on. no no it's fine I, do you know do you know one of the reasons why i'm letting you speak is there's just a conscious stream of thought and Ooh. it's like there's certain questions I want to ask and you, you, as you're speaking, you're answering them. I'm like, wow, okay, this is interesting. Now, it, w- what I find interesting about what you're saying so far is you are like some people that say, okay, we went through the care system. They will talk about how they drifted and, you know, they got into all sorts of situations. Now, you found strength in seeing what your two elder brothers wanted to do and how it wasn't working out. You found strength in a negative outcome, right? Mm. Other people would find strength in mentorship, like positivity in terms of, okay, someone is saying, oh, you need, do you know what I mean? It, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand how your mind works because, <laughs> <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? Because, <laughs> you, you know, like. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're obviously a very good listener and that's really, really oh, key as well, you. the quality yeah. in life, yeah. Because you, you've mm. actually touched on something that I was talking to myself about. I do talk to myself um, as mm. well. And I think that's very healthy again the western world will treat you like that you're mad isn't it but mm, you need to talk mm. to yourself so i was talking to myself and i was like wow like people during this covid period have really been suffering and i and i and i understand that you know what i mean yeah. and i respect that and i know that everyone's got different levels of life but for me mm. it's been an absolutely incredible period in my life because for the first time i could unapologetically stop not work not have to engage like i deleted my instagram feed and people are like what the hell are you doing are you all that's right that's tough man that's tough in this day and age <laughs> that's tough and it was i wanted to show myself are you addicted are you hmm. addicted to validation to likes ah, comments, interesting followers? and when i cut that cord you know this 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 imaginary relationship to an application on a freaking phone are you for mm, real mm, mm. and i self-analyze the relationships that I genuinely value and the people who I've spoken, who have now been forced to call me or I've called them, not forced in the sense of, you better call me, but it's like, <laughs> oh, you want to hit me? You need to phone my phone. And not <laughs> you just, you know, just stalk me on Instagram and Facebook. I hear you, yeah. yeah and you mean that my life as well because I'm showing you my augmented reality mm-hmm. on an application. Sure. Highlight reel, really, so, yeah. Right, the highlight reel, but to go back to what you was originally saying, Mm. part of my personality, and maybe I'm just mad in it, and I mean that with the greatest of like zeal and excitement, is that I am one of those probably strange or rare people that thrives in chaos. Okay. Things are going bad, that's when I come at like, oh, yes. And that's mm. terrible because learnt behaviour in a sense of so when things are going well, I'm slightly on edge because I'm like, ah, oh, I'm so used to things being hard mm. and time tough, mm. like COVID. I'm like, yeah, brilliant. All right, <laughs> come on, <laughs> in, come on, life, let's go because yeah. I've, I've had hard times. I know isolation. I know yeah. stress. Like, yeah. what you for me? Let me mm. see how I can move with this. Mm. And just this time, I've written two feature-length scripts, a book. Wow. During um, this whole COVID period. Yeah, during the last three interesting. months. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. 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 You know, I mean, I've, I've been growing my hair. I'm slim. Like <laughs> you're I'm, slim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling good. <laughs> I hear that, man. You know I, mean? I hear that. Like, the collective emotion yeah. is the complete opposite of how I feel. Mm. Correct me or wrong, is this learned behavior or is this something that you were born with? I will cover it in the book uh, when okay. it comes out, but it's um it's it's like a it's it's a it's a stress it's a reaction to stress. Got you. Um that I experienced from a young age. Mm. Um and it's basically something called fight or flight. It's just that it's yeah. either are you gonna run mm. or are you gonna go to into the battlefield? Mm. 
for me, I've never, I, 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 I rarely, I rarely, I. Sometimes I fly, like take take off, like now nah, mm-hmm. I'm not going to deal with this. But most of the time, I will it's fight. I will go into it. Yeah, come on then, let's have yeah. it. You know, <laughs> let's see what's gonna. Because I'm going to win in yeah. the end. Yeah. Um. You know, but what I want to do through the book is to teach people how to, um have it all without having to fight <laughs> mm, that, would, that would be interesting to read <laughs> so i mean look at the end of the day there's so much about your life that we could cover now i want us to move further into some of the organizations i mean the companies you built and how you started and, and all of that what i would start with is let's talk about your education right because what's okay. interesting about your education is how you move from there into your first entrepreneurial endeavor. So let's talk about your drama education and why did you feel you needed to drop that for a while? Yeah, I mean, I, I got my uh, my GCSEs, nine GCSEs. I went to college, did drama, mm. media and English. Dropped. Mm. I did business, but I dropped out after eight weeks. I just found it very boring the way the teacher was teaching it. I knew <laughs> okay. I was smart enough, but I didn't enjoy it. You know what I mean? I only do things that I enjoy. I just think mm. losing my dad at a young age, life is just too short. So mm. I don't, I've never really got into things that I don't enjoy. So I so I did that. And then I got into the uni- first university of my choice, Brunel, uh, mm-hmm. which is an American university in, in London, England, um, Oxbridge and I did drama with film and TV so it's actually a joint honours it's like doing two degrees in one because you're studying film Mm -hmm. from behind the camera so sound lighting DOP like cinematography the whole thing wow the whole thing and then you're doing straight acting as well like acting for screen acting for stage so it's like it was a it's an acting and directing degree in one but it was called mm. drama with film and tv so that's why i chose it because wow. i thought this could be really interesting and it was it was it was a really dope um course but mm. i realized very quickly that the pathway for white actors on my course was very clear for them like oh yeah we're gonna get you into this you know theater and we're gonna mm. do that for for the few uh, black faces that were on my course they just didn't have anything to to give to us and we didn't know where to start and you know we really learned very quickly that it's who's who and so and mom knows so and so and you know, how many brown faces did we see on telly for even just 15 years ago when I graduated, you know, 14, mm. 15 years ago now? Not mm. many, right? And mm. and, and we're, still, we're still fighting for those injustices now, today. Mm. So back then, it was worse, and I'm sure 15 years before I came on the scene, it was bleak. Mm. So I got it, and I thought, you know what? I started going for auditions, mm. and I would get like, oh, the nurse. And I mm. would, I remember I played the nurse three times for three Comedy times. Central. Oh, yeah, okay. on three different shows. What kind of nurse no... role was this? Was that like a nurse just... and you had a lot of lines or? No, I'm just about to say that. I literally had no lines. I came on, I delivered the baby and I go. That's it. And one of them was comedy and I literally delivered a turkey. It was like, I thought, it's you know what? Turkey. <laughs> I um finished like eight pounds a day. I'm actually meant to live like this is I'm better off being on the dole. This is actually mm. like ridiculous. So I just thought, you know what? Let me see. Is it is it more education? So I started going to the um identity drama school. I started doing um Strasbourg and method mm. acting and mm. all these different classes. I got a lambda distinction. Like I thought maybe it's my credibility, maybe I need more than a degree. Mm-hmm. Then I got a scholarship. I applied to the New York Film. You know, is it the New York Film Academy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, that's it. And um, they've got a branch in LA. And Mm. I got into one in LA, but they could only afford me half a scholarship. Okay. The course was 4,000. They Mm. they gave me half, and they said I have to raise the other half. And I was like, oh, man. Wow. Do you know what? Do I do this or do I raise 10 grand and start a business? Now, whilst mm. I was doing my degree, I was working on the weekends as a makeup artist for like luxury brands in department stores. Mm. Um, and would we'll fluctuate between that and working at another high street brand. I'm not going to give them any shout outs. People know my bio um, yeah. can look 
stuff if they really wanted, but it's, that's irrelevant. I was working in makeup and beauty. I was doing makeup for short films, magazines, mm-hmm. uh, sports brands, different things with a couple of girlfriends. And um, I thought, Do you know what? I've always wanted to own my own beauty company. Okay. Working in- even though I was part time, I was always uh. like a manager at these companies because I would come up with makeup looks. I always knew what was on trend. I could mm. visualize where the market was going. I was, all, you know, one of the best sales agents in the com- company. Yeah. So I thought, you know what? I could apply that same zeal and, and set up my own skincare. Let me try. Because I had all these skin allergies and food allergies, and I would go to the GP and get laughed at and just told to take paracetamol and get out of my office. I thought, <laughs> let me put my own health in my own hands, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> let me try and research. This is like the early days of Google, you know, uh, mm. 2007, 2008. Okay. Um, I started mixing and blending some products in my kitchen. I would go to local. Um, local, uh, what do you call them? Like uh, sales places, like uh, markets, local markets. Okay. And I just test and try the products on people, and they loved it. You know, they'd come back a month later and say, "I finished the pot, love wow. it." Can I get two more? And two more would turn into four more, and bringing friends with them. And within eighteen months, I got a little following. Wait, so, wait. You know what? Okay. Let me let me interject. Right. So. Okay, this is this is this is quite intriguing. So, how old were you at this stage? This this was your twenty what roughly? Twenty. I was twenty two. Twenty two. So the twenty two. I've got. I've got. I've got. A, I've got like a niece who's twenty early twenty two. Twenty two, and yeah. you you're going through your drama school. You're like mm, you're, you're doing your thing. At the same, obviously, yeah. you're you're so driven. You're already. I think now you're like a seasoned entrepreneur. If you're selling ice cream at that tender age. You probably don't yeah. a few. So now you're now in this world where you're figuring stuff out and you're saying mm-hmm. to yourself, I'm going to go to the market, the street market on the road, pick stuff mm-hmm. up, make mm-hmm. stuff a product. Um, weren't you afraid of people reacting to it? How did you like, <laughs> like, honestly, that's the next I, level. Yeah. Do you know what? Again, just that level of supreme self-confidence, like, mm. I know they're going to love it because I knew what it did for me. Right, Obviously, right. I was my own first guinea pig, in it. I went from it. having dark marks and eczema and acne, two of the worst skin types, to having like flawless skin. And I remember my bro- one of my brothers, Andy, who I absolutely love. Mm. Well, I love both of them, but he's like, we're like very, <laughs> very close. <laughs> he He's very blunt. Like Andy's mm. like, he's not very curt. Got so you. he. He's the type of brother like, like holds your like face and goes, yo, Claire. And like looks to side side sis, <laughs> man. You're getting a lot of pimples, sis. <laughs> like, Thanks, and <laughs> so I remember he came to my flat and he was like, Yo, sis, your skin's clear, isn't it? Have you cleared it? What have you done? Mm. I said, bro, I've actually been making my own cream. He's like, really? You should sell it, Claire. Sell wow. it, man. Like, wow. you like, yeah, man, you should sell it because if it helped you, it mm. could help others. And I was like, you're right. Okay, I'm going to do it. So mm. I've got my little handmade labels stuck on with sellotape. Like, looking back, I was actually a complete nutter. Like, but I think I believe in God and I believe in God bless the trier. And I remember someone said, a guy said that on my stool he said you know what god bless you god blesses a trier mm. you've tried you're doing it mm. you're not thinking you're not sitting there going oh, i've got the magic potion but because i lack self-confidence i'm not going to share that with the world because what if what if i get arrested what if it's not yeah legislative? yeah what, just do it man yeah you know, yeah Hey, what leg- I didn't know what legislation I needed at 22. Mm-hmm. I didn't know safety checks I needed. Mm. I didn't know, you know, I, and I tell my customers, look, this batch is a bit runny. The next batch might be too hard. Mm. You know, I'm baking this stuff on my stove at home. Wow. In my fridge freezer. Sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it, is what it is like it's for your skin if it doesn't work, discard it. <laughs> wow. Only That's- guarantee it's it's funny man it's like um have you heard of madam cj walker i have when i watched that uh documentary on netflix i yeah. actually cried because i could i was uh, like look, look at my that's, that's look you at man. My elder. look that's at my elder it. i didn't even know her story but i saw so much of me and her 
Definitely. But I just said, you see how the spirit of uh, an African woman is so strong. Yeah. What I mean, we just we're so we're geniuses. No, definitely. I mean, it's like you know, it's like women plates and hair. Like my younger sister, she's very mm-hmm. good with her hands, hair, right. makeup, all of that. You know, and I've got a lot yeah. of. Other, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. It's just the confidence to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to move from. Get, making it in my, my stove, getting it out there to now making it into like a branded business yeah. that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like people would yeah. feel comfortable. And that was where you took it to. So, okay, so you're, you're, you're still kind of like getting things together. It's a bit scrappy and everything. Yeah. At what time did you make that transition to so Premier? Did, yeah, so what happened is I had it under a test name. Um, I was going to close down and um, get some funding. So what I did, I trained as a teacher. Uh, wow, so I got okay. my in education because I thought, you know what? The b- business is shaky, in it? We were just about to go into a recession, 2009. Mm. And I said to myself, look, if the business doesn't work out, I still need a career in it. Otherwise, I'm going to be a broke actor, director. Mm, so, mm. And, and you were still acting. The acting thing was still going on at this stage, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. okay what, when, when did you draw that line and say you know what acting just chill just chill i've tried i've tried i've done I've it off i've got my uh, business loan for pre so that was my 26th birthday mm. july 2011 when i mm. registered the company i said i'm not doing nothing else in my life for, for right now i'm claire aluka at the time that's my mm. dad's name mm. um the founder of Prime Skincare. That's it. And then I launched officially December the first, twenty eleven. Yeah, you got a you got a bank loan or a loan from I got a bank loan from HSBC. Thankfully, okay. I took on a girl as a as an apprentice. Sure. Her big sister was a manager at HSBC Black Girl. Mm. And she fought for me. Oh, I wow. submitted my business plan twice. She said, Claire, I'm presenting this to white men over the age of 60. They just don't think you're investable. And then she mm. said, when she then she said, okay, apart from the skincare, what what are you gonna do if you if the skincare fails? And I said, Well, look, I just qualified as a teacher. Mm. And she was like, bingo, okay, they'll give it to you. So she went back in, she told them she's a qualified teacher, she'll work to get that 25 grand back. Okay. So they'll Okay, cool. All right, we'll give it to her. So they gave me 25 gram. Mm. And um, I got my website. I got a little small team. Um, I was able to make up, you know, bigger orders mm. of product. Um, within a couple of, like, 40 days, the brand was already award nominated and we won. Wow. Into the hands of a journalist who had a skin condition called psoriasis. Psoriasis, and it helped, okay. Yeah, it healed. Psoriasis is, like, the worst skin type. What is like, that? an extreme of eczema. It's when your immune system is shut down and your skin starts to kind of attack itself. Okay. So um, you get very blotchy skin, uh, very raw, very red. If mm. you're white, um, kind of very dark black marks if you're black. Unexplained itchiness, like shingles underneath the skin. Like it's just, yeah. it's just horrendous. Um, and that's usually an immuno situation. But... Mm. By the time it presents itself in the skin, the skin needs help as well as your diet. Yeah. So the products took away her scars and helped her skin. And so she put it up for this award and it got it. And then it just, it was like every four months after that, for a period of five years, we won an award somewhere. So I've actually got 17 hmm. awards for the brand. 17 awards. Wow. Yeah. None uh, of them were I was looking for. I was just trying to just do my thing. I, I had yeah, imposter yeah. syndrome for a little while, you know, I was... <laughs> I'm young, I'm black, I'm competing with like billion dollar white American companies. Yeah. Um, how did you break then, through all of that? Like the whole, sorry to interject, but how did you break through the, the were there any monoliths or rather the, you know, the, the gatekeepers of the industry, all of that? Oh yeah, of course, every day, every day. Mm. And mm. you know, they would try and order my staff to copy my recipes and... Mm pass it off as their own. I really taught them what it meant to be vegan and allergen friendly. I mean, all these terms are now very com- common now. You know, it's mm. all common. Yeah. But we're talking about 2011, you know, when it's like, oh, it's vegan. It's all like yeah. a dirty 
do you know in the beauty industry but yeah. now they, they've been forced to go that way and I was a front runner and a pioneer in that space and that's why the Queen awarded me uh, for my services to dermatology in 2017 yeah. and I believe I'm to get that award and um, I'm proud of that because it represented hard work you know, it represented that, wow you, you are being seen Claire yes you are you know making money and you're winning awards but actually the royal family they purchased my products um, okay. I'd say the exact person's name because that sure. would mean that they're endorsing it but um, one of Prince William's cousins uses my brand and mm. um, you know for, for eczema and um, that product won an award that year and you know it just a lot of divine things would happen like that where you're because just like, you wow. tried because you tried because you tried you know God blesses the trier you know I I'm, a, I'm a doer. I don't like to talk too much about I hate like so you see no shade but I don't enjoy the term like coming soon my thing mm. is just come I hear you just I hear come you. I just, just <laughs> launch you get what I'm saying just launch this stop like the coming that. soon you know what I, I like mean that. because it's like you're kind of giving yourself too much scope to what if something goes wrong and you can't come soon mm. but if we don't know we would just when it arrives it arrives I hear like that I hear that under unnecessary pressure <laughs> well yeah. you could just wait and drop it when it's hot mm. or before you're even ready and learn on the job like I do you get what yeah. I'm saying I'm not polished I don't even believe in perfection mm. I believe in excellence but I don't believe in perfection because I know mm. nothing can be perfect I'm not a perfect person. Mm. I launch things sometimes before they're ready, but I just say to myself, "It's it's it's good enough," and I'll and I'll learn the rest as I go along. Do you think that's a big recipe for success in general? I do. When mm. I research and look at my my peers, and I have my sort of like mastermind meetings with, say, <laughs> Oprah <laughs> and Spike Lee and mm. Nora Ephron or Anita Roddick, who's passed on from the Body Shop. Like, mm. I think. I hear their voices and I'm like, so what would they do? What would mm. they think? Mm. And they would do exactly what I'm doing because they've done it. They jumped into the frying pan, yeah. you know, and learned how, how to dance with the heat under their feet. You know, nothing mm. was perfect. Sure. And there kind of isn't a, really a right time for anything, whether that's becoming a parent, getting married, starting a business. You, you could always say, oh, this is not the right time. Yeah. You know, I could say it's not the right time to write a book. I could say it's mm. not the right time to go into filmmaking, but mm. it just, something in my spirit feels right. Yeah. I could strictly plan out and I sort of see the end in, in, in my sight. So I'm like, okay, yeah. I know how it's gonna end. Kind of got a strategy there. Okay, cool. I, I'm gonna run with this. Yeah. I'm gonna see how it's gonna go. And then the universe conspires with you to make sure it happens because yeah. you're you're definite now in what you want to do do you know what i mean but i think a lot mm. of people procrastinate and talk themselves out of things mm. because they want all the way perfect and there's all the way perfect because people might look at me and think, oh no shade is a perfect person that feels far from perfect mm. Mm. i'm far mm. from perfect as a first time director but it was divine because I listened to my spirit. My spirit said, you know what, five years, you absolutely killed it. What, what about film? This could be the perfect time to actually go into film. And because of the confidence that I had built up through yeah. being involved with Buff, behind the scenes, quietly doing PR for the festival yeah. uh, with my sister, promoting unknown filmmakers, thinking, do you know what, I, I could do this. Then I became a script judge at Bath and I was reading scripts and thinking, wow, man, these people are so talented. Yeah. What would to write a script? Can I do it? Do I have it in me? Is, it, is my degree too old now? You know, you start to... <laughs> you start to box yourself in. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe my time has passed. And then I said, time has passed. Mm. I'm first to do. Mm. In Africa, I'm a child. You're a child oh, until you're course. like... <laughs> your, your time has passed you're 32 like are you all right yeah. so that that year that summer of 2017 when women started asking me about bleaching creams i mm. thought i don't 
the way the beauty world's going. I don't like the Kylie Jenner energy of contour and it's all about the makeup, it's all about the Botox and the phone, you know, the, the, the mm -hmm. plastic surgery look that everyone had going on. Yeah. Um, I thought this is an opportune time to write a story about a girl that people can relate to, you know, with a dark skinned woman as the lead cast member. Okay. And I'll tell you a little secret. I approached I approached loads of actresses like I really yeah. wanted Shana, the Shana Lynch. Mm. And she was almost gonna do it, but I think between Bulletproof and now I understand James Bond, her agent was like Ah, uh, <gasps> I see. No, but thanks for thinking, mm, could she do it? Mm, ah, I don't think she's too busy, Claire. Sorry. That's what the agent said. Oh, man. Okay, cool. And then I thought, well, yeah, she's got bulletproof. Okay. Yeah. And if I saw the James Bond thing a year later, I was like, oh, God, no. No, that makes yeah. sense, isn't it? It would have coincided <laughs> and that would have given this little. I mean, if she was on your film, man, that would have also been interesting as well. Yeah, it would have been mm. a blessing for both of us. And I Definitely. think, you know, um, yeah, it would have been absolutely insane. So, yeah, everything everything happens for a reason. Every, but um, every... I'm happy with the cast that I've got now because no, they definitely. were... Um, and they are absolutely outstanding talent, you know. Like, they make my movie, you know. I no, gave definitely. them words Wait, and so... I to them, but they brought that relationship that people just can't forget about. You know, Jade and Danny, Adele yeah. and the actors yeah um, they you know together they they've changed my life you know so i'm i'm very very grateful to them now the, the, sorry to interject now there's something interesting about that film no shade and i'm gonna get to that now in terms of premier skincare right mm -hmm. you said a lot of things that i want to unpack and it actually even that this scenario that i'm going to talk about it leads into buff and it also leads into how you distributed your film now, you came into an industry which you, you said your competitions were multi-million, multi-billion dollar industries. They had the <laughs> ability to get your product, understand it, and break you. Like, they could do that just yeah. like that, right? Yeah, overnight, and overnight. Recently, overnight, yeah. they could have done that. And uh, how are you able to maintain consistency for five years, mar especially marketing your product, like making it loud? I mean, social media wasn't really that big then. It wasn't, was it? and mobile shopping was it was even less. Like people were very skeptical about PayPal, mm. and, you know, buying online. People wanted to still see me at trade shows and fairs, mm. and you know. How did you um, pull that off, man? Like, how did you? Did you how many hours did you sleep in a day? I, I, I never slept. I got four to six hours sleep a night for five years. Wow. Um, I look back on those days, and it's because I was I was young. You know, I was twenty six to. 31 mm. prime of life um fit as a fiddle mm. and um I, I i just ran on adrenaline for five years you know yeah, um yeah. every time i wanted to break or cry or give up i'd win another award it boosts my self-esteem and i think what i learned from a young age comes yeah. back again that no one can beat me mm. Like, I don't believe in competition in that regard. Yeah, of course, you've got billions. You're a billionaire. I'm a thousandaire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You compete financially, but financially is only half a measure of a man or a woman. You know what uh, I mean? It's like uh, everything. Uh, you can't yeah. replicate my energy. Yeah. You can't replicate when I call my customers and wish them happy Christmas and they're like, oh, mm. oh my God. Oh, Dr. Claire, wow. Mm. You know, mm. you're the first CEO of a company, that founder, mm. that has ever phoned me. Like, that means so much to me. Mm. Like, wow. Thank you, you know, Gillian or Valerie, you know. So you're, that was a USB, isn't it? Yeah, that, you, because that, cause I, can't, I can't compete with giving you free products every day and free gifts and buy one get one free and all the things that the big boys can do but i can call you for sure. half an hour and sure. say hi yeah yeah like that yeah. Enough, enough unlimited minutes on my phone in it yeah <laughs> like yeah. relationships customer service mm. is something a lot of these big companies lack mm. because they're so big automated service 
can't speak to a human voice on the phone or if you do they're in Timbuktu or Siberia <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> yeah <laughs> on Bangladesh not, yeah right mm, yeah. you don't get the feeling of this is somebody that's here to take care of me you get a feeling of oh, I'm just ten a penny to this company mm. you know yes I get my goods on time and blah but that personalised service and that's why I didn't sleep much because I was always on. I was always on. I'd answer emails within an hour. Mm. I'd people if there was an issue or if they, you know, just wanted to rant. My, we had an intimate relationship, me and my customers. They meant everything to me. So that was how you kind of like stayed relevant. That's again, yeah. in regards to competition. And your staff yeah. strengths, did you have people you brought in every now and again? Did you have like a steady staff? No. <laughs> the short answer I couldn't afford them. Uh, I had friends that would help I took on apprentices so in the first two years of Prima I was still teaching so I would teach part time to bring in some extra money when I was short um, or sales were low and then obviously kids would read about me in the newspapers be like Mr Luca is this you and I'm like shh, shh, shh. <laughs> Wow. you're like moonlighted right I'm like basically she's like I'm an entrepreneur but I t- can teach as well and obviously I'm a qualified teacher so don't say anything to the teachers when, when I, but miss when I become 16 can I work for you I'm like yeah 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 so I set up an email address <laughs> yeah. so that kids could email me there um and when they turned 16 they came to work at my flagship store and um they were apprentices so i paid them you know just below minimum wage and um yeah they would help you know bottle label feel sell and they're like 21 now and they they dm me message me on twitter all the time clay changed my life love you i'm like yeah man you look my little sister that's good that's good wow 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 so that, yeah. so that was kind of like your setup the whole period. And then, you know, obviously from what you've said, you got to the point where you're now like, you know what, you've done enough, you've got your awards and you wanted to make that switch based on interactions with customers who wanted to bleach your skin. Yeah. Oh man. That was, that was a big moment because I'm, I'm trying to put myself, because as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm trying to pr- visualize, project myself in your shoes, which is almost impossible, but I put myself <laughs> in your shoes. You're sitting down in your clinic um, at Harley, <laughs> Harley, you know, Harley, yeah. at Harley Street, right? Which is not cheap. Um, and you're there and they show up and then you're like, hmm, I'm going to pack all this up and make a film about you guys to talk about colorism. Yeah. Man. I don't know, man. Listen, what I'm saying like, it's it's. It... Do you see how that sounds? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, it sounds mad, doesn't it? But that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm a bit mad. I will do things like that. I will just suddenly yeah. decide that I've had, you know, I've I've I've, I've climbed I've climbed this mountain. Mm. Now I'm gonna climb another mountain. Right. So it's not even it's, about the money to you, isn't it? it? It's. Would you say? I mean, would you say it's it's is it about the money? It's because it doesn't sound like it's about no, money to you. Is no, it, is it? no, no, mm. no. Because if it was about the money, I wouldn't have started Primo. I forgot to say. I was not what you've done? To say, I've got so many. Sorry. Yeah. What would you have done? You sh- you want to start Primo? What would you have been the alternative? Stories. Basically, the first month that I started Primo. I was contacted by a massive beauty brand asking yeah. me to come and be their, their formulator, their scientist, but I'd have to move to Dublin. Oh, wow. And I be would have been earning more money than I could count. Wow. And I could do it. I was like, oh. Ooh. It's almost wow. like an offbeat of refuse, you know? But I was like, but you see, you see how God's testing me hmm. to de- to see if I would derail myself. Why did you say no? Like because I can't. I, I'm a, I'd be a terrible employee at that time. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like hmm. I'd I'd been selling on my markets. I'd psyched myself up. Yeah. To jump off the safety harness of a retail job or a teaching job. Yeah. 
I've launched against all odds. There's another story, but again, I'm not even going to give credibility to the person, but, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, the, 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 the first, first brand I had, yeah. uh, somebody stole it from me. Like, do you see what I mean? So I went through a little bit of hardship mm-hmm. and I thought, nah, I've got the loan now. I need mm. to come. And I need to I need to see this through. So so you got this going to jump off this mountain to go to another mountain. You get what I'm saying? I hear you. Yeah. So when you like when you the, got the loan, is that when the company contacted you? Sorry. Is it when you you the company that contacted you after you got the loan? They contacted me. Yeah, literally, I got the loan in July. They contacted yeah. me. I didn't launch. Remember for five yeah. months. I went okay. underground because I was still releasing myself and removing myself from my the kind of prototype of Prime, which some loser tried to steal. Well, not tried, they stole off me mm. um, in the sense of the name and the website. They signed over the stuff to themselves. And I, I said, it's fine, because I was already going to relaunch anyway. But it's your former partners. I mean, obviously, it's... Um... Yeah. Okay, got you, got you. So this mm. is like an ex-boyfriend. Can you imagine? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there there's so many stories like that. Like, right, right, right. Yeah. And it's like, dude, man. Even, do you know the like, funny thing, Claire? This is yeah. so CJ Walker. You know that, right? Yeah. This is, can you see why I, just, I cried? The similarity is scary, <laughs> man. be insane. Yeah. So, You know, I went underground for five Mm. months. I remember when I came back in December, people were, they were floored. Like, Mm. we thought you'd be in a straitjacket because you, he betrayed you. Like, he took your brand, he passed it off as his own. And I said, well, I've got legal advice. And they said, Claire, you're the genius. It was a start, it wasn't even a startup. You hadn't even registered as a company at that. Well, you had registered, but you, you weren't making any real money. What's 10 grand? Yeah, don't I hear money. You. Yeah, you got a loan now. Start again, new name. Come back, kill it, and he'll be dead in the water. Don't that's talk what about him publicly. That's what my brothers and sisters advised me. Yeah, because I was seething. I wanted to shame him and all that. I said at the beginning because I had to tell my customers, "Don't buy from him. I, I'm not with that company anymore. I'm going to come back. Please wait for me." And you know what? They all did. Hmm. And December the 1st, I switched the website on. And then February, I was contacted by this other company. Hmm. And I thought, oh. Hmm. Now it makes a lot of sense, yeah. Because they could see this is a, this challenger brand. Hmm. Who the hell is this? Who is hmm. this girl? Let's, let's buy people? the brain behind it. Let's buy her out. Right. Show her company. Get her out the way. Or let her bring her mind to our company. Acquisition, man. Right. But yeah. I said, you know what? No, nah, this is a this is a divine journey. I've, I could mm. have been finished, you know. If I didn't get that loan, I wouldn't have been able to come back. I wouldn't have been able to recover. Mm. And emotionally, I would have went down in flames. Yeah. So I had to see it through. And I'm glad I did, you know. And when I reached five years, he emailed me some nasty rant about, you know, I just said, look, man. Five years. You know, <laughs> jealousy is a sickness. Get well soon. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's, it's weird, man. Like, looking at your life so far, it's been interesting. Like, you know, foster care system, parents, yeah. um, and then you 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 went into drama school, and then all yeah. of a sudden you're like, you know, it's just not working. At the same time, you're hustling, you're doing the makeup and everything, and then you yeah. go into business, and you've got all these challenges, you know. Yeah. You, and then you got to the stage where you know what, I'm going to put everything aside, and I'm going to make a film about, you know, the challenges I'm seeing. Yeah. Now, what, what I find intriguing at this stage and, and your story is how you decided to go about making the film. Now, mm. before we before we even go there, there is a very crucial part of your story, which I don't want to go too deep into because that's, I would love to hear from the other person involved in the story, if you know what I mean. Now, yeah. at some point, you, you, you stumbled upon an organization that changed the direction of your life called the yeah. Bridge Urban Film Festival. Yeah. Tell me about that encounter. <laughs> Thank you.
guys i have to end it here but good news part two is coming out in a few days i'm excited honestly i am i hope you guys enjoy this episode um it's just filled with so much information and it's just interesting to hear claire's journey from her tender young age in the foster care to where she is now it's just of stuff i mean it's made for movies honestly um part two is equally as interesting as claire talks about her work with a british urban film festival as the marketing director and pr consultant and also she talks about her film no shade very intriguing um journey in that film she talks about why the film was made how she made it how she raised the money and also she talks about the distribution the challenges she faces and all that raw uncut conversation man honestly and feel free let me know what you think about this episode drop your comments claire would love to know what you think as well guys i'm gonna leave you here now with a word of advice die empty whatever thoughts and imaginations you have in you whatever dreams whatever (sighs) die empty um I lost a friend recently and also this a man that inspired me years ago that I also lost this year. And um, one thing that came to mind and really touched me is the fact that we never know when our time is up, right? Imagine this scenario. If someone told you you had two days left on this earth, what will be your regret? I would say don't let your regret be that you didn't love your family well enough, you didn't love your friends, your partners well enough, your wife, your husband well enough. And don't let it be that you had ideas and dreams and things you wanted to do, but you procrastinated. Die empty, guys. Because at the end, everything turns to dust. Everything. Everything. And with that, I'll leave you on a much hyper note. Peace, love, and happiness, and see you guys in the conclusion of this conversation I had with Dr. Claire. This is to all.